I'm so honored and excited to introduce Dr. Michelle Benengas to the podcast. She wrote a book called Teacher Leadership for Schoolwide English Learning. Dr. Benengas, bienvenido al podcast. Gracias. Thank you so much for the invitation, Tan. I really appreciate it. Well, it. The honor is all mine. Can you please tell us about your proudest professional achievement and award? This is not a time to be humble. So it's impossible to choose the proudest, right? And and I don't know that I could choose one, but I'll share one that really stands out to me. Um, and it has to do with teacher education. Um, in 2019, we hosted um, an ELM project summit. So the ELM, um, the ELM project, the English Learners in the Mainstream project, is a grant that was issued from the U.S. Department of Education to me and my colleagues at Hamlin University to train teacher leaders. Um, here in the state of Minnesota, um, depending on the year, we have more um, refugees per capita than any other state, and the majority of our teachers have no preparation to meet their needs. So we came up with this creative idea to um, to kind of like build capacity within our teaching force to be uh, teacher trainers, to train their colleagues, not just teach the kids, but train their colleagues so that kids would have this uninterrupted language learning experience throughout the day and not just be sitting around waiting for their EL or their MLL teacher to meet with them. And um, so really the initiative here was let's build capacity, right? That was really kind of the thinking. Um, and we started this initiative in 2016, and we were at our height in 2019. And we pulled together about 150 teacher leaders from across the state that year, um, pulled them into a ballroom and, you know, trained them. And we were talking about, you know, their year of implementation and how they were going to go out into their school districts and train their colleagues. And then you start thinking about the capacity that that will build, right? If you have 150 leaders and they're going to be giving professional development and they're going to be coaching their colleagues and the energy in the room was electric. And it made me think, wow, my objective here was to, you know, help kids in classrooms. And this initiative will help kids in classrooms, but it also has a side effect. And the side effect is that it elevates a teaching force that has been marginalized for a long time that in the case of our state is largely female. Um, and, and in our home state, we had recently launched co-teaching, sometimes in ways that were beautiful, but sometimes in ways that were ill thought out and positioned well-prepared experts as tutors in classrooms. So we had people who, you know, they had master's degrees and were applied linguists and they were glorified tutors. And now they were sitting in this room and saying, I've got a chance to showcase what I know. I know a lot of stuff and I get to teach it to other people. And I would say that that moment was just so exciting for me to see, hey, I can be helping kids, those kids that I've been caring about my whole career. But at the same time, I can elevate professionals that have been deprofessionalized for such a long time. And that was really cool. So as you can imagine, everybody knows what ha what comes next in a story about 2019, uh, 2020 came, right? And uh, so then we had to rethink. And this interview, I think, is going to be a lot about the what came next. Um, but that moment was really cool. So actually, I, before I go to the other questions, let's, let's, uh, let's stay with this question a little bit, the award that you received. So how did teachers, how did you do that? How did you elevate um, what looks like glorified aid to um, qualified instructors, instructors? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's probably true in every state in the United States and maybe around the world, I don't know, that the role of the EL teacher is ambiguous, right? So, um, you know, sometimes that it, it's just the person that pulls kids out and, you know, meets with them in the closet or meets with them in the hallway, right? Um, sometimes it's a teacher who who co-teaches and has a true, um, you know, co-teaching, um, equitable relationship with another colleague. Um, and what we had seen in our state was kind of a crumbling of the role of the EL teacher. And, um, and so I think just turning to uh, an ESL teacher, that's the name of the license in our state, and saying, hey, you're an expert. I see your expertise. Your colleagues can benefit from it, was magic. In fact, 
there was a moment where there was an argument about one of the teachers said, I'm not an expert. I'm not Stephen Krashen. Who am I to say that I'm an expert? Um, and then there was somebody from the other side of the ballroom saying, of course you are. If you aren't an expert, who is, right? If you don't identify in this building as the, the expert over multilingual learning, then these kids have nobody. Um, so I think really kind of a, a, a selling this idea to a bunch of folks who had maybe been kind of demoralized that you know a lot of things, you have a lot of skills. And if if we can use those skills, not just for, for kids' immediate benefit, but for their teacher's benefit, in the long run, it's going to be better for the kids and it's going to be better for your identity as a professional. So it's very similar to the way that teachers describe their students is the way that students believe in, them, believe in themselves. It's the same way you're saying when we describe our colleagues in a certain way, they will start to live up to that. And so we, you are messaging back and mirroring back to them their value and their worth and their expertise. Exactly. And it's fun to hear, you know, we, we use the term coach. Our, our coaches come back and say, I've been working with these colleagues for years. They didn't even know what I did. Now they know what I do and they seek me out for my expertise. And that's a game changer. I think that's what happens when they, they're, when you sit and you co-plan and you show them another way of looking at instruction, they're like, oh, I never thought about this way. I'll see you next week for co-planning. Right? And exactly. that's what happens. And that's what job embedded professional learning is. It's like when I, when schools come and ask me, what can we do? I always look at, look, let's, let's look at your schedule. Are your teachers co-planning? Right? Cause that's really where uh, the change happens systematically and for an enduring mm -hmm. amount of time. Let's talk about an experience that has influenced your practice to this day. Hmm. Again, it's hard to pick one. But I think that what I realized when I became a teacher of multilingual learners is that the tools that I needed in my toolkit went so far beyond language teaching. And what I was prepared to do was teach language. Um, so when I found myself in the teacher educator role, which is what I do now at Hamlin University, I thought, you know, we cannot limit methods to how languages are learned and how language should be taught. Um, so I thought about all of the, I call them critical incidents, you know, the times where I fumbled, like I just didn't know how to support a student. And, and I thought, okay, how, how can we integrate these into the classroom? So um, we launched a, like a two credit advocacy class. Well, we had one in existence and kind of modified it um, and kept adding, you know, as, as our graduates would, would respond and say, Hey, I don't know anything about dual identified students. Like if somebody's special ed and labeled an English learner, like how do we identify them and how do we support them? Or tell me more about family involvement. Or I'm really concerned about um about ICE, about immigration, and you know, and my students and their families feeling safe. A lot of these themes that they don't have anything to do with language teaching, but they're so central to the work and the life of, of English language teaching. So I created a new course, um, and, and it's a four-credit course. It's called Critical Praxis in TESOL, and it's part of the methods block. So if you want to become an ESL teacher, you need to take a semester-long course in all things non-language teaching, right? So, you know, public health, how do immigrants enter the country? That's a topic that, like, so few teachers know about. So what does it mean to be a refugee? Uh, what does it mean to um, to be undocumented? Um, so like, what are all of those processes? When people say, why don't you just immigrate the right way? What does that mean? Like, so um, so we talk to people through, through the U.S. Embassy. We talk to refugee resettlement agencies. We talk to immigration attorneys um, about, about some of those themes that I think teachers need to know about, but we're just not prepared in that stuff when we go through teacher education. I feel like that your book you just talked about, your course you just talked about, I hope it becomes a book that you write in the future. Oh, that's a good idea. I love it. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. So right there, Seed. Let's dive into your, your current book. Congratulations on the new okay. book. Every seed, Thank every you. book has a seed. What was the seed for this book? I think the seed was, you know, I started my career as a, as a, teacher of English learners or multilingual learners in a newcomer school. 
And so everybody in this high school, this lovely high school, um, was a newcomer to the United States and really felt supported and was, you know, simultaneously getting language education while they were learning um, biology or while they were learning algebra. And so that was just the way I experienced English language teaching. Um, and then I started to see that that is not the norm at all. Um, in fact, the norm is that, you know, kids sit in the back of the room or have teachers that have varied abilities to meet their needs. Um, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not, but there is really isn't a, there isn't a, a norm there, right? You could, it can be a, a smattering of, of experiences that our English learners have. Um, and so that really was the impetus for us to write this grant is to do better by our kids, right? And when we got the grant, which was incredible, it was a 14% acceptance rate. It was a $1.4 million grant. And we are a little university in St. Paul, Minnesota. So we were competing against some big dogs and that was really cool. Um, I, I also need to share that that my co-author was uh, Professor Emeritus Ann Mabbitt. I was a first year professor, like that was all her. Um, but at any rate, we got the grant, the, the momentum was building, we had trained 402 teacher leaders, and it was like, now what? And so it was so obvious that the next thing we needed to do is move it beyond the state level. And how can we get this written down in a way that everybody can pick it up and read it? And that was the seed for the book. So the book is really based on what we learned through the Elm Project. So let's share what you've learned. Let's go to uh, the first part of the book, which is about the foundations for school-wide systems for academic language across the school day. Can you talk about these systems and provide a specific example from schools? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll share that we have some assumptions going into preparing a coach. Um, and I also want to share a little bit about verbiage before I move forward. So the grant was called the Elm Project, the English Learners in the Mainstream Project. Um, we were not able to continue using that name, um, and we switched to SWELL. So SWELL is school-wide English learning. That has to do with it being a federal grant, and, and we like our new name better anyway. So um, so SWELL is the term that we use now, um, SWELL coaches. And um, our assumption when we're preparing SWELL coaches, which we do across the country, I just mentioned I'm heading out to uh, coastal Oregon next week. Um, our assumption is that the folks that show up to do this, this training or that would pick up our book to read it are already applied linguists. So these are people that really, they're teaching uh, multilingual learners. They know about what it means to teach and learn language. Um, and so really our approach is more about andragogy, which is a new word for a lot of people. Andragogy is the teaching of adults, right? Based on adult learning theory, very different from pedagogy. So it's about andragogy, but it's also about um, systems, right? So thinking about uh, leadership systems. Um, we talk about how SWELL is situated in a distributed leadership model. So if you were try to try to put SWELL into a hierarchical leadership model, it wouldn't work. So if you teach in an environment where the principal, you know, says, shut your door and mind your own business, you know, I make the decisions, this model isn't going to move forward. This is a model that assumes that there are a variety of leaders in the building. The principal is one of them. You're also one of them. Um, and so I, I would say it really looks at kind of the foundations of distributed or shared leadership. Um, and we rely heavily as well on um, some of the high flyers as it relates to um, coaching like Elena Aguilar and Jim Knight. And I would be remiss if I did not mention my co-author, um, Dr. Amy Stoppelstead. She and I have really um, driven the Elm Project and Swell forward um, through TESOL International. Um, so, so she really, she wrote her dissertation on this topic around leadership. So she would speak to it much better than, than I could. But how important it is to have a leadership structure in place that um, embraces the professionalism of all of the professionals in the building, not just some of them. Would you describe that model of SWELL? Sure, absolutely. So um, we currently see a coaching model that looks like this. It looks like um, you've got a high achieving or a, a successful teacher, and we say, you are so good, we're going to pull you out of the classroom. And now we're going to have you exclusively coach. 
And there is a funny cultural thing that happens when we do that. We talk about the egalitarian culture of teachers and there's this very, um, very careful, um, you don't know any more than I do. We're all the same, right? And that comes from a place of humility. It actually grows out of teacher unionization, which is very healthy, right? We should be humble and we should support each other. But what's hard is when somebody jumps ship, that might be the language we use, right? You you left, Tom. Tom, you're not one of us anymore. What the heck do you know? You haven't been in the classroom for years. And now you're an outsider, right? So so we see that as a current model for coaching and we see some problems with that. Another current model for coaching is um, what we call sit and get. Um, when we presented this in Northern Ireland, they called it jet in, jet out, which I thought was really beautiful way to say the same thing. Um, and we know that that style of professional development, we don't have a lot of evidence in the literature to show that it results in instructional change. What results in instructional change is to have somebody who is there in the context, a member of the community, a practitioner um, who is also um, leading the professional development of their colleagues. So a swell coach um, does a few things. One is they... Um, they facilitate in tandem with the administrator an action plan. So they identify what are the needs of our school? What do our teachers need to know more about? And then they develop, then they lead professional development on those themes. We develop, and you'll see in the book, what we call PD plans. These are professional development plans, and they're kind of canned teacher professional development under the, the what we believe are the skills, knowledge, and disposition areas that all teachers should have in order to meet the needs of multilingual learners. Now, they can use them exactly ha- as we have presented them, or they can modify them, that's fine. But we know that teachers, you know, have enough on their plate already, so, so let's offer some resources. So they provide professional development to their colleagues. They also coach their colleagues, and coaching can look any number of ways. It can be your old fashioned, I sit in the back of the room, I observe you, I give feedback. Um, It can be, I help you co-plan. It can be, I look at the assessment that you've developed to help you figure out if it's linguistically appropriate for your learners. And so that's kind of a one-on-one support. And then they are a member of the strategic planning team for the school. So they are, you know, a part of the, what should our service model look like, right? How can we do better? What are our areas of weakness? Um, so those are kind of the roles that a swell coach takes on. Um, and a really critical part of this is administrator buy-in. So we always train administrators as well um, because we have to build time in for the swell coach to do this work. Um, if it's just them, um, you know, saying that they're game, that's great, but that doesn't move anything forward unless we have the administrator saying, I'm willing to give this teacher every Friday morning or, you know, work into their schedule, how they can be a leader as well. When we look at a schedule, um, that really shows what the school cares about. So when you have a teacher, uh, a principal say, yeah, I'm going to schedule this person to do coaching, to do co-planning. It's great. How do you, a lot of, when I talk to teachers, a lot of them say, yeah, I don't have buy-in from my principal. So what Mm -hmm. do you do to, to shift that thinking? Oh, that's hard. I mean, uh, I could answer that in a number of ways. You know what? I'm going to answer that the way that I would answer my graduates, okay, as a professor. So I have students come to me and they say, I'm in a workplace where I don't feel honored. I feel that my expertise is not being valued, but the kids are so great and the kids need me. And so I, I don't know what to do. And my response to that where I live, because I I live in a big city, is there are kids that will need you everywhere. Go somewhere where you will be honored. Um, We have lost so many teachers over the last, you know, three years alone. And I think it has a lot to do with, um, with just teachers not being honored for the experts and the humans that they are. And so as, as hard as it is to make that decision, to leave a space that doesn't honor your expertise, I think that it's important. We need to model for kids that, you know, we will only be in spaces that hold us up. And so I I think I would talk to that teacher about, you know, is it a healthy environment for you? And if not, find other ones where you can thrive. Exactly. Exactly. I know a, a term that's been going around a lot that I'm really pushing back against is teacher shortage. And when I hear people say there's a teacher shortage, I say there is a perceived teacher shortage. 
the perceived teacher shortage is that we have so many teachers who are choosing not to be in the classroom. In my home state, 50% of our licensed teachers are choosing not to be in the classroom because it's not it's not an environment where they can thrive and and finish off their careers. That's not a them problem. That's an us problem. And and who's the us? I uh, I would say that anybody that is has anything to do with funding schools. So taxpayers, right? Policymakers, we are not designing school systems that support the professionals that need to move the school system forward. In the same way, we uh, it, the, the parallel is when we create instruction, when we design instruction, we create the um, conditions for students to be successful. In the same way, if we want teachers to stay in our schools, um, everyone involved, the stakeholders have to figure out, oh, what are the conditions student teachers need to feel uh, valued and respected and heard? So, yeah. Exactly. And if that teacher stays in that school and burns out and leaves the profession, well, now we've really done a disservice to our kids, right? It would be better to have that teacher go a district over where there are still kids and families that need them and they can feel honored and do good work. So you're saying uh, don't try to convince the principal to change their mind, find different principals, different schools. Yeah. Unfortunately, yes, that's what right. I'm saying. Right. So let's talk about peer coaching as part C. Can you please describe what peer coaching mm-hmm. is and examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a really um, verbose phrase to describe our model, and it is non-evaluative peer instructional coaching. All right. So the non-evaluative part is critical that I am not coming into your classroom to um, to like help you get a raise or to help you get tenure or you might get fired after I come into your classroom. It's none of that. Right. We are peers. We are partners. We have parity. You know some things I don't know. I know some things you don't know. And so um, I would sit with you ahead of time and say, hey, you know, what are your priorities as it relates to the multilingual learners in your class? Like, what are your concerns? And you might tell me something like, well, the multilingual learners are not, don't talk a lot in my class. And I might say, all right, that's what I'm going to be looking for. I'm going to, you know, observe your instruction and I'm going to look for avenues where you can encourage oral interaction. Or um, why don't we sit down and look at your lesson plan? And I'm going to make some suggestions for how multilingual learners can have more opportunities to speak. So what I'm describing right now is the swell coaching cycle. You might also show up and say, I don't know. I don't know what I need to work on. In that case, I might just come and observe you and say, well, here are three things that I noticed that I think you could work on. And then the feedback that I give you is tailored to that one item, right? So I'm not going to say, well, you did this wrong and you did that wrong. And no, I'm, I'm going to say, all right, you asked me to give you feedback on you know, oral interaction. Um, so that that's what I'm going to give you feedback on. Um, I'm going to send you some resources and then I'm going to check in with you and then I'm going to come back and observe again. So you get to show me like, hey, look, I made some changes to my instruction. What is, how about this? Is this pretty good? Um, and I might say, yep, that's great. And, and the coaching cycle sometimes goes on for an entire academic year. Um, it really depends on that model. We have some coaches that coach a few of their colleagues over a long period of time. So I might coach like three or four colleagues for the whole year. We have other coaches who coach for a short period of time and believe it or not, have wait lists of colleagues that want to meet with them. So some of them will say, I've got 10, I've got 12 on my wait list. And so as soon as you feel like you've gotten to a pretty good spot with your goal, then I'll say, all right, thanks. I'm going to move on to the next person. And you can circle back later when you've got something else that you want to work on, but you know where to find me and you know what I can help you with. So it's a blend of instructional coaching. It's more instructional coaching than teacher, teacher like co-teaching where um, if there's a designated time. It's, it's an instructional coach, basically the role of that. Right? Yeah. So we talk about when, when we train, coaches and when we work with administrators, we have them do what we call a mental audit on the ways in which schools serve multilingual learners. So I'm going to do it with you as well. And for anybody that's listening, you can do this mental audit. So the first way that schools serve multilingual learners is through direct instruction. All right. So direct instruction is when the the English language development certified teacher is working with 
learners of English, right? So this can be pull out a newcomer class and it's it's just me and kids who are all learning English, right? So I want you to think about how well you think your school or your district is serving those learners. The next area is integrated service. And integrated is anytime we have tandem between the English language teacher and the gen ed teacher or the gen ed curriculum, right? So co-teaching is, is a very common um, presentation of integrated instruction, right? That we've got these two professionals side by side. Um, it could also be sheltered instruction, right? So I could have gen ed curriculum, but I'm an English language teacher and I'm taking that. Um, so then I would ask the teachers to think about how well do you think your school, not you, how well do you think your system is supporting students in an integrated um, environment? And now the last one is in, or indirect service. Indirect service is attention to language development when the English language teacher is not in the room. All right. So how have your gen ed teachers been prepared to meet the language development needs of those kids in the classroom? Um, and how well do you think your system is supporting kids in those spaces? So take an inventory of that. And now the final question is, where do you need the most help? Where do you need the most work? And overwhelmingly, people say indirect service, right? That's the area where they tend to say direct service, we're nailing it, right? So people went to university, they learned how to teach language, they know what to do when their door is closed. Uh, indirect is, excuse me, integrated is kind of all over the place. There are states that are really nailing co-teaching and it's beautiful, right? There are other places where it's not, but indirect across the board, people feel like we're not doing this well. And that's where SWELL comes in. And so SWELL comes in in the coaching cycle. Can you tell us about the model, like the the phases of SWELL again? Yeah, absolutely. So, so again, we talk about SWELL as not being an initiative because schools have a thousand initiatives. Swell, swell is the infrastructure to support the initiatives that you have, right? So Swell is we have appointed this person. They have the knowledge base and the skill to move GLAD forward, to move PSYOP forward, right? To, to move whatever initiative, to make sure that we all understand kids' WIDA levels, whatever it is, right? So that's what Swell is. If somebody were to say, what is Swell? It's the infrastructure that holds initiatives together for the betterment of multilingual learning. Um, but the coaching cycle is one piece of it, right? So if I'm doing traditional coaching, then yes, I would start off with what are your goals, asking that gen ed teacher, what are your goals, and then coming in and observing or taking a look at your materials, giving you feedback, and then there's this back and forth that happens over a period of time. Now, because I'm a researcher, I can share that this work was originally um, a quasi-experimental mixed methods study, right? So those 402 teacher leaders that we prepared were participants in our study. Um, and so it was, we used what we called initially, we called it the observation tool, but some of our local unions said, no, you can't call that an observation tool. So we changed it to a support tool. All right. Um, but nonetheless, what, what we had our coaches doing was, was using this tool and saying, now, what do you want to work on? Okay, you want to work on um, sentence level language, attention to sentence level work, because you've just been doing vocabulary. Okay, I can help you with that, right? So now when I use this observation tool, my pre is not going to have a lot of it, because you just told me you, you don't really know how to do it, right? My post is going to show growth, right? It should, hopefully, if this relationship worked, right? Um, and that tool was an instrument for this research. And what we found is that there is statistically significant evidence that teacher practices change when working with a site-based coach. Now, that's really cool. It's a cool response to that sit and get PD doesn't work, right? Because guess what does work? Your colleague down the hall working in tandem with you. So why I guess what you're saying is the SWELL model is an answer to the, the, the limitations of uh, jet in, jet out, where it's like, my colleague is not going to jet in, jet out because we drive in together to the school and we're yes. there together and we'll find time to work together. It, it's not teacher collaboration, but it's developing the teacher's ability to work with, um, with multilinguals. Right. And with the jet in, jet out, like, 
don't get me wrong. I love it. I do that, right? I, I go places and I give professional development, but I'm also well aware that I don't know the context, right? I don't know the families. I don't know, like, you know, what are some of the really big challenges that that community or the big successes that that community has had. Um, and so, so, you know, yes, soliciting support and feedback from outside of the community is great, but the mechanism that should move leadership and development forward should be internal, not external. Would you describe how one school has done this or a school district has done this and wrote this out or like the most successful one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I need to make a decision between Minnesota and Michigan. Um, I think I'll go Minnesota because we've been working with them longer. But Grand Rapids, Michigan, you're doing great. They are doing so great. Um, we're in our, well, like our sixth year of working with them, but second year of, of district-wide coaching. Um, so I think I would talk about District 196. Um, anybody from District 196, Egan, Apple Valley, Rosemont, you guys are doing great. Um, and this is a district that started um, with the Elm Project many years ago, maybe six years ago. And they started small. I think that folks who start small are always the most successful, right? So they started by sending a few, feeling it out. I don't know what I think about this. Um, Amy, my colleague, always calls these folks the the difference between the early adopters and the late adopters. Like, are you going to be the first one to buy the new iPhone when it comes out? Or are you going to wait a little while, see what other people think? Like, actually, the late adopter... I think does better, but so, so district 196 um, really took their time, rolled this out slowly. Now they're in maybe year six or seven and they, their goal is to have at least one swell coach in every school district wide. So elementary, middle and secondary. And I just cannot express to you how successful this district has been. Um, kids know that all of their teachers are on board that you know, the multilingual kids are not just the students of the English language teachers. They're everybody's students, and they know that. Um, so it, now that, that this system is so ingrained in the school, you know, the gen ed teachers know who the English language teachers are. They solicit them for support. If anybody gets hired in that district, they know this is what we do. Um, a number of our, our districts that hire um, new teachers, it's even in the job post right now that you need to be willing to to be a teacher educator as well as an educator of kids. Um, and so I would just say that that district has been really impressive. And now I'm going to share again kind of the, the happy side effect. The happy side effect is that these folks who are recognized for their leadership capacity are now getting doctorates, are now like writing their own books are doing incredible things. Like Sarah George just defended her dissertation and she's now a doctor and she started out as an Elm coach. Um, so we have people really kind of recognizing, gee, I really do know some things that can help some people. I'm going to look for some other opportunities to be a leader and advocate for my learners. So, because I'm a I'm a slow processor, I'm starting to understand what um, swell is a swell coach is. It's it's a uh, schools have instructional coaches for math, for literacy. This is instructional coaches for teachers of MLs. And so teachers of, so content teachers can go to them, homeroom teachers can go to them, but also specifically uh, English language specialists can go to them and say, you're, I need help with figuring out how to co-teach. Yeah. I need help figuring out exactly. how to support students, how to read. Um, can you guide me through that model? Yeah. So yeah, cool. Yeah, it's not, shoot, we don't know what to do. We better hire a professor from far away. It's, I know what to do. I've got this professional down the hall. Um, so we also talk about it as a step between teacher and principal. So there's this feeling, if I want to be a leader, I have to leave. And that doesn't feel good, right? Like so many teachers are like, I love what I'm doing. I don't want to leave. You can be a teacher leader. Right. You can you, there are levels of leadership between teacher and administrator. And what we find is that that is the, the key factor in teacher satisfaction and teacher retention is opportunities for leadership. In fact, Amy always shares this and I think people roll their eyes, but it's good to know it's even more impactful than money. So I could offer you a raise or I could offer you opportunities for leadership and teachers will take the leadership 
They all deserve the raise. Don't get me wrong. But the leadership and being recognized for your expertise is really important. It's about seeing themselves uh, contributing meaningfully to the school. Yes. And that leadership title is that recognition of their value of what they can do. Yes, absolutely. You're, let's end the book with um, intentionally planning for swell. Can you talk to us about the process and share a school, how they plan for that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think what's important, again, to reiterate is that swell is not an initiative. So when we think of initiatives, and we often talk about initiative fatigue, that schools, teachers are like, come on, we've got another initiative this year, and it's another acronym. And I thought we were doing that other initiative. Um So really intentional to be thinking about this as not an initiative, but as a support that is not going away, right? So we have this support person. And if you decide to take on a new literacy curriculum in five years or a new math curriculum for that matter, great, you still have this support person, right? You still have this person who's the expert who can say, "Uh, I don't know about that math curriculum. Let's make sure that it's appropriate for our multilingual learners. And so kind of central to SWELL is having an annual action plan. And we have a template for that. It identifies, um, There's it starts with a needs analysis. So who are our learners? What are our areas of need? We write SMART goals. Um, So, you know, what is the goal that we're going to set for this year as it relates to teacher practices and multilingual learners? Um, And we, what are the obstacles? What is the timeline? We roll it all out. Then at the end of the year, our coaches present um, to their colleagues, to their administrators. We just had some 196 folks present to their superintendent's cabinet, which is really cool. Um, that doesn't always happen, but they get to share their successes, right? So they they get to give a presentation on, you know, hey, this is what we did. These, these were our goals. This is how we met them. If they use our tools, which they're welcome to, then they really have quantitative data too to say, this is how we moved the needle And then they have a conversation about next year. So do we want to keep focusing on the same goal? Because I feel like we really haven't gotten there yet. Or are we ready to put that goal away and set a new goal for our colleagues? Um, And so that's an iterative every year process. And now when we work with coaches, we often see them come in with their colleagues action plan from last year. So I'm a new teacher in a school but I, we have this action plan, and now I'm part of the revamping of the action plan for this year. Um, so it tends to be kind of a, a living document and not just a one-year thing. So there's something interesting about um, your program. You've actually partnered with TESO International. Can you tell us about that? Exactly. Yeah, we are thrilled to share that we are uh, TESO International's, one of their top teacher professional development Um, programs were actually second to the six principles, which is really cool. Um, And so when um, when school districts express interest in SWELL, um, they reach out to TESOL. So if you are interested, you can email SWELL, S-W-E-L, at TESOL.org. You can also go to our website, which is TESOLSWELL.org. And you can take a look at the offerings that we have. So this book had such a huge reception that um, TESOL wanted to immediately um, convert it into a training. So we've taken the training that we did here in the state of Minnesota and expanded it. Um, it's a week-long training. So we we travel out to different school districts. We're working with the North Dakota Department of Education, for example. So sometimes we work with state education agencies um, and prepare leaders in large spaces. Um, We also do what we call global cohorts. Global cohorts meet once a week in the afternoons on Zoom. And those are really fun because you've got, um, you know, we had a group of teachers in South Dakota who teach in Hutterite colonies. So their English learners speak German, I believe, during the day, working with with Caribbean-born ESL teachers in Maryland um, and putting their heads together around how they can best serve these radically different learners, which is so cool. Um, So these are kind of the two approaches, right? One approach is to participate in the global cohort where you've got teacher leaders from all over the world. We've got people in other parts of the world as as well as not just the United States. Or um, we do come out and do um, trainings on site for kind of a more in-depth systems-wide approach. Well, now, if you have the endorsement of TESO, that is high, high praise. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Well, let's end our podcast. I enjoy uh, be, having you on the podcast and I can already imagine all the ways that uh, teachers are going to think, oh, you know, we can implement SWELL. And so I'm going to, I hope they run to bookstores and on Amazon and wherever they can get books to purchase your book. Let's end with this very uh, quick uh, rapid fire question. It's called Traffic Light Teaching. It's thinking about what teachers should start doing, stop doing, and continue doing when working with MLs. What they should start, what they should stop, and what they should continue. Okay. I think that they should start. I'm going to go back to the teacher um, self-care. They should start prioritizing themselves as, as professionals, right? Because our multilingual learners will not thrive if we're not caring for ourselves as humans and as professionals. So if you're not doing that, make decisions that take care of you, eat hard decisions. Um, what they should stop doing is same thing. Um, stop um, continuing in environments that don't value your expertise. You have a lot of knowledge under your belt. And that knowledge is great for kids, but it's also great for your colleagues. We want to hear from you in conferences. We want you to be writing, you know, articles in local journals. We want you to be writing opinion editorials in the local newspaper. Um, you know, we want your expertise to be out there. So um, I would say stop um, accepting environments that don't welcome your expertise. So I would say all of those things that you're doing on the side that, you know, that are, you know, the side conversations that you're having with your colleagues, right, in the hallway where they're like, I don't know how to help Opti and you're talking with them. Keep doing that. That is part of your job, right, that that we very much see the the work that, that you're doing that is not direct language instruction of kids is is a critical part of your job. And I want to say personally, I see it. We see it. Um, it's not invisible labor. It's critical to the well-being of our learners. Well, Dr. Beningas, thank you so much for spending time on the podcast and providing a really tangible framework for teachers to make language learning and supporting multilinguals a school-wide priority. Where someone says, oh, I know how to do this. I have a swell coach. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.